Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So we're going to continue on in our uh, discussion of the main obstacles that the human being faces on their spiritual path to Allah. And uh, the section that we're on is specifically covering the, the uh, obstacles in relation or the main enemies of the human being, you could say. And so these enemies are uh, the dunya and all of the allurements of the dunya, uh, bad company, shaitan, which is a very obvious one, and then the nafs. And so what we're covering, what we've been covering last time, what we'll cover today is the nafs. This is the ego. The nafs is defined, just as a refresher, as the ego, the lower self, the part in us, which is constantly commanding us to do evil and to follow our desires. Within the nafs, you have the element of desire, the hawa, which is trying to get us to uh, follow various degrees of desires. And we covered the different desires last time. We spoke about um, the appetites that the human being has. It begins with the appetite for food. And that's why fasting is a big part of our religion. Because if someone can cut or tame, rather, the appetite for food, taming is the right way to do it, then uh, the rest of the desires become easier to tame, which is why, again, the whole month, which is all about trying to tame many desires, but specifically focusing on the desire for food. We then have the the, uh, the the appetite of desire, of sexual desire, rather. Then there's the, the desire for money. Then it goes into the desire for fame, then for followers, and then power and control. And it kind of, um, is a, the higher levels of that include the, level, the desire for leadership and kind of being in control of a lot of people. These are all subtle desires that come out at different points in the life of the human being. When we're younger, we'll face different desires than when we're 30, than when we're 40, than when we're 50, than when we're 60. These desires will evolve. And the one who has a comprehensive treatment for their nafs, their desires will get better. Uh, they, they will rather be able to manage the desires that come um, later uh, later in life. Uh, and so that's what we've been, we've been covering. Now, what we're going to focus on today um, is he's going to a section which is about taqwa and how taqwa is really the way to guard ourselves against the tricks of the nafs. And then he's going to get into, and we probably won't get into the depths of this today, we'll wait for it until next time, but how there's different organs that you and I need to guard, or rather different limbs. And each limb has a stage of taqwa associated with it. And these are doors into your nafs. So you have the eye, the ear, the um, heart itself, the stomach, um, and the tongue. These are the ones he's going to eventually cover. He's going to go deep into each of them. He's going to give us a, a comprehensive cure and treatment for how we cure um, all of these different different uh, desires that might come to us through the lens, inshallah. So, um, but focus really, as we covered last time, the three ways to comprehensively cure the nafs. The first is um, to deprive it of its appetites because it's like an animal. When you give an animal everything it wants, it can act up. But um, these days in the modern world, we don't engage with animals the way that they used to back in uh, traditional societies. But the way that the examples of scholars always use it, it's like, like a donkey or a bull or a horse, where you have to give it some kind of a reward, and sometimes you take something away so that you can tame it. That's the way the nafs works. The second is that you, you deprive it of its appetites. The second is that you give it a lot of ibadah to do, a lot of worship. Worship is something the nafs is naturally... Um, it doesn't like, in its, early, in its earlier stages, it doesn't like to wake up early in the morning for fudger. It doesn't like to pray on time. It, it's inclined towards, la towards laziness and procrastination. It doesn't like to do extra ibadah and these types of things. And so worship would be the second thing to comprehensively cure it. And the third is really a, from the depths of our soul and the depths of our heart, rather, begging to Allah for assistance. Because ultimately, only Allah can help us uh, go process of defeating our own nafs. It's not something we can do in ourselves. Allah says in the Quran, that we created a human being weak, state of weakness, and that only the one Allah helps and who Allah has mercy on, they will be able to um, defeat the nafs and they will be able to defeat shaitan and so on. So that's the comprehensive treatment. Now we're going to get into specifics and we're going to talk about um, why taqwa is so important, and then how you go about attaining taqwa. Now, this comes at a good time because today, I believe today or yesterday, was the first day of Sha'ban. That means that we are now exactly 29 or 30 days away from the month of Ramadan. Um, and Ramadan is going to come sooner than we know it. And Ramadan is the month in which the believer tries to attain a state of taqwa, where Allah says in the Quran um, that, Ya 
uh, that you fast, fasting has been prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those who came before you in order that you might attain a state of taqwa and we, we're, and taqwa is a very very big word, it's a big concept, it's hard to translate but it's this idea of being aware of Allah in every moment and acting with that in mind with every time we engage with the creation that we are aware that Allah is watching us and that he is um, that he is present and uh, so he's going to get into what taqwa is and 12 different wisdoms of taqwa and then we'll get into the different um, the different limbs and how to cure the, the ways that, that those go into the next so the first thing with regards to taqwa it's one of the highest stations that you can attain in our religion and it's something that Allah commands the believers to get to and when you attain these states for example Allah says in the Quran when preparing for Hajj, um, I don't know if people in this room have been for, for Hajj, uh, but maybe has, has anyone here been for Hajj? Or for uh, Umrah? Okay, that's Umrah, right? Um, and so when you go to Umrah or to the holy cities, what 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 would you have to do? Like you usually have to do some level of preparation. You have to pack a lot of things. You have to get your visa. You have to make sure that you have a tour guide or, or an agent or someone to help you with the process. You have to book your hotel. There's a lot of stuff you have to do. And in the um, traditional times, it was a lot more prep than what we have to do when you would go. Allah's example, he was in the Quran specifically is for Hajj. But when you would go to the Holy Land, it's a lot of preparation because you can't just hop on a quick flight, have luggage, and then you just show up there and you can be there for a week or two and you come back. It's not like that. It was a multi-month journey that would have to be taken from whichever part of the world you were in. You would have to um, that make sure you have transportation arranged, that you have a boat or a ship that takes you from one place to the next place. Then you're traveling by camel or walking often if you couldn't afford it. And there's only so much provision and that you can take with you. You have to make sure you have places arranged to stay along the way and so on. So Allah says that take your provision, but the khair, the best provision that you can have, is taqwa. He says the best provision you can have on this journey is taqwa. And hajj really is a symbol for the journey of life. Hajj is a symbol for the journey of life, where you and I are all on this journey, and hajj symbolizes us eventually reaching this state where we are going to die. And every, each level of hajj has a different link to death, and with the wisdoms of, of, of that, that's a separate kind of discussion. But Allah says have taqwa as the best provision. So many times we think that, oh, the best thing that I could attain is a lot of money. If I could just get a salary of this much money, and if I could get this much stocks, and if I could get this many, this nice car, or if I could buy the six-bedroom house or the five-bedroom house, or you know, the, the exactly the dunya life that I want, that's the best thing that could have in terms of provision. But Allah wants us to challenge that. He says, no, 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 no. That's all worldly stuff. I really don't care about that. Allah does not care. He gives people he loves. A lot of good and a lot of um, outward uh, material things in this world, and he gives people he does not love at all those things. It has nothing to do with Allah's love for you, absolutely zero. The people who Allah loves the most, he tests them, and many times he tests them through poverty and through difficulty. Um, and it doesn't indicate Allah's love for a person. But what does indicate Allah's love for a person is the spiritual provision that you and I have been given. So we have to flip our understanding, and this is what he's going to get to. The gifts that you get are not gifts of the dunya. That's not the type of gift we want. Sometimes we think, and it is, we, we're still grateful for it, but we think that if I get this material thing, or if I get this material thing, or I look in a certain way, or I you know, get exactly the grade that I want, or get into the school that I want, that that is the best gift I can have from Allah. That's good. That's not a bad, that's a good gift, and we should be grateful, but that's not even close to the best gifts. The best gifts that the believer asks for are spiritual gifts which is why there's a concept in our religion which is known as your spiritual risk, your spiritual risk. Your spiritual risk is your spiritual provision. Just like you have dunya provision, you have spiritual provision. And this is something you and I want to increase up. And this is everything to do with how much ibadah someone is able to do, the presence that they have in their worship, the feelings of intimacy that they may feel with their Lord in their ibadah, the feeling of nearness that they may feel, um, all the spiritual stations that are given, these are all like robes that are given to someone, spiritual robes. The khair, the best of the provision that Allah describes is taqwa, because it's all-encompassing. So 
So that is something for us to keep in mind. When we go into Ramadan, it's like thinking through, it's like thinking about a, making an intention of having the best gift we could get in the entire universe, and we have it available to us in that month. Allah gives us the ability to get it specifically in that month by doing certain things and by being present, and we'll walk away from it completely cleansed and dressed in a very, very beautiful spiritual dress, you could say. That's like the, the way that the scholars talk about it. So that is what taqwa is all about. Um, and it's something we should want. We should regularly make dua to Allah. Um, uh, we should regularly make dua to Allah about that. Okay, so the first praise or benefit of taqwa, Allah says, is that um, if the, for the one who has patience and taqwa, that is a very, very amazing thing in the sight of Allah, that that belongs to the azmil amur. The azmil amur is like a, uh, a very high status in the sight of Allah. Allah likes it when people have azm, resolution, and they're steadfast. That it's a sign of spiritual strength outwardly when someone has this. And so Allah, is, he begins by praising taqwa. That's the way Imam al-Zali um, is talking about it here. It's, a, it's an expression of praise. So Allah, we already talked about why it's so important. Allah, anytime it's important, he magnifies something himself. Anytime something's important. The most important gift that the Ummah has ever been given, has been magnified the most, is the Prophet Allah says in the Quran that what a fa'na lak dhikrak, and we've elevated your mention. And so he himself is the best gift for the Ummah, the, the, how close someone's connection is to the Prophet how much love we have for him, how much we desire to follow his sunnah, that will ultimately dictate the, um, the station of taqwa that we have because he is the imam al-muntaqeen. He's the imam of the people of taqwa. So Allah starts by praising this, right? And we know anything that God praises, you and I ideally should feel like, okay, Allah, Allah likes this. And then he talks about things in a, in a negative context, right? So in the Quran, the dunya is never spoken about positively. We talk about this in the section of the dunya. It's always like, the distractions of this world, the allurements of this world, it's empty, it's even the words used for it are empty, more empty words. It's like like a, a vegetation that grows and then it, all of a sudden it turns into the yellow dry vegetate the yellow dry um, leaves and then it withers away. That's how Allah talks about dunya. But when he talks about spiritual realities, there's a lot of praise. Allah says this is from the best of things. This is from the Azm al Hamur, the steadfast of things. And he praises his messengers in that way and he praises these spiritual virtues. The key to solving the problems that we have as an ummah today is to shift this mindset. Because the ummah, we think just like Western society that's very capitalistic in nature and consumeristic in nature has trained us to think that the best thing in dunya, the car that we have, the house that we have, the salary that we have, the position we have, the status that we have, the followers, the fame, all these things of dunya. That's what the society we live in. It makes us think like that. But Allah does not give way to it. And that's why someone who's attached to the Book of Allah, they will be able to have um, a, a kind of better understanding of these things. The second thing is that taqwa protects you completely. Yes. Oh, I'm gonna, okay, great. Yeah, we're gonna have some some snacks and shall prepared by our by the this wonderful resident chef of Lighthouse um, Mike. So the, the second thing, and sorry for those online, um, the next time join us in person at Lighthouse in Oakland and you can, you can get the snacks as well. Um, the second is Allah says that the one who has taqwa, Allah protects that person from the people who are trying to harm them. And this is really important. So Allah says, if wa in tasbiru wa tattaqu, when you have patience and practice taqwa, their guile, their plotting will never harm you. It won't harm somebody. It might look like it's harming someone outwardly, but it will not actually harm them in reality. And this is also very, very um, uh, important to keep in mind. That when you have taqwa, you're entering now into a state of spiritual realities. It's not just about outwardly someone says this. How do we know this? Look at the life of the prophets and then look at the life of the great imams of this religion. They went through immense persecution and difficulty, but they weren't harmed by it. It's actually amazing. Say, the, the Khatib was saying this on Friday. It's in Ibrahim Islam, the Prophet Abraham, peace be upon him. He literally, as a, as a young man, a huge catapult was built for him, and then this huge fire was, was burning 
that he was catapulted from, from one place all the way into the fire. Completely like, just what kind of persecution is that? All because he's trying to tell them, don't uh, believe in the idols, believe in Allah. And anybody who tries to do good, they are following in the footsteps of the messengers. And anyone who tries to call to Tawheed and to the worship of Allah, they are following in the footsteps, ultimately, of the messengers, Ibrahim al Islam being one of the chief messengers. But look at the harm that happened to him, just because they were trying to do good, just because he was trying to call to good. But he said what? Hasbunallah wa ni'mal wakil. He's in the middle of the, of, of, the, of the catapulting, in the middle of the air. Jibreel alayhi salam, the archangel Gabriel comes to him and says, do you need anything? And he's in a complete state of just internalized reality of taqwa and reliance on Allah. And he knows this ayah, and he knows the principles of this religion, that if you have patience and taqwa, that it will never harm you. Their gaya will never harm you. And so he says, well, from you, you're a created being just like me. I don't need anything. Allah is sufficient for me. And then what does Allah do? He says to the fire, kunu bi bardan wa salam, peaceful and cool for Abraham. And, and, it, and it was, and it was, it was as though he's in the depths of his tribulation, but he's in a relaxed state, and it's all cool and peaceful for him. That's what taqwa does. It's not that the bad thing doesn't happen; it's that you know how to get through the difficulty. And it's a very important reminder in the times that we live in. You have other examples of someone who's not a prophet, the great Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, rahimullah, that he went through one of the four imams of the four madhabs, that he went through immense persecution. Many of us don't know how much he went through to make sure that our aqidah was correct. He was um, constantly being persecuted by this group known as the Mu'tazilai, but that, and they were innovators in the religion, and they basically um, denied aspects of theology that are essential to know. And it's, they, 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 they believe that human beings create their own actions, and that things are not created by Allah. There's a lot of problems with the Mu'tazilai thinking. And he defended them, and he was tortured, tortured, and, and literally almost killed. He was thrown in jail, and then tortured. And all the other, many of the other imams at the time, they uh, they did this thing kind of like an inquisition where they went to the houses of the different imams, and they said, do you believe this theology or not? And many of them, they caved in. They're like, yeah, yeah, we believe it. We believe it. We believe the, 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 this, this innovative theology. He didn't cave in. He said, no, of course not. He said, no, everything you're saying is completely wrong. He defended it, he wrote refutations, and it is because of him that the Muslims, that Allah through him, gave Muslims victory in having correct belief in theology. Otherwise, just like the Christians have these crazy concepts, of, I mean, not to disparage another religion, but just like there's concepts which we would find very disagreeable in, in their theology, the Muslims were having crazy ideas come into our theology because of, 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 of innovative groups. And he corrected that. He went through persecution, but he had taqwa, and Allah got him out of it. Imam al-Shafi also was thrown in prison for a period of time. Many of the great imams of this religion were thrown in prison because they were trying to preach something that not everybody liked. Imam Malik was beaten by the ruler. Literally, he ordered him to be whipped multiple times. So there's a lot of the, this, the, but they all had taqwa of Allah, and they got through it. Yes, it was painful outwardly, but inwardly, Allah got them through that. That's the lesson of taqwa, is that if you have taqwa, their guile will never harm you. It won't hurt you. Yes, some of them were martyred. And many of them were martyred. Yes, and many of them, great point. And many of them were literally martyred vis-a-bilillah, that on the path, on the path to, to Allah. We know this about many of the Sahaba, that literally they're, 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 they were killed defending this religion. And that's a high station of martyrdom. But they, they knew, and okay, they might hurt me, they might wound me, they might, the, that they have, they might um, harm me physically, but with Allah, I'm in a good place. So outward harm, doesn't relate to inward harm if someone has taqwa. And that's ultimately the goal of disciplining the nafs is to teach the nafs that. Because your nafs wants to only protect everything outwardly. And it starts at a very basic level. Oh, I'm hungry. Oh, I want to do this. Oh, I'm lazy. Oh, I'm going to procrastinate. Oh, I'm, I mean, the type of stuff we go through, like, you know, it's very, very much um, the basics, many of us. Right? We're just trying to struggle, with, you know, and not to diminish it or anything or minimize it, but it's obviously not always at the level of like we're being persecuted for defending the theology of the ummah and thousand years plus will be affected by our stance, right? We're not necessarily going through that. But the stuff we do go through, the nafs wants to think about it outwardly, all in the form of bodily desires. Allah wants you to think about it all in the form of spiritual realities. And ultimately, the human being balances that by trying to tame bodily desires and get into a state of 
uh, of spiritual realities, inshallah. Um, so that is the, the second thing. The third then is that when you have taqwa, Allah is in a state, Allah puts you in a state where his special assistance is with you. And ultimately, in order to defeat the enemies of shaitan and the nafs, you need the special assistance of Allah to be with you. You need it. You and I won't do it. You can't do it ourselves. We cannot rely on our own selves, our own abilities, our, our ibadah, or our knowledge, whatever stuff we do, we can't rely on that. We rely on Allah ultimately. And so Allah says that in Allah, Allah is with the people of taqwa. He is with the people who have this true devotion and those who are active in goodness. Now imagine you're going through something and you know you're trying to do the right thing. You know Allah has your back because he's literally with you. In a, in a, in a, not in any anthropomorphic physical way, but the assistance of Allah is with you. You're going to do the right thing and you're going to know I have, you're going to have firm resolution in that. And Allah says um, that, Wallahu waliyul muntaqeen. Allah is the wali of the muntaqeen. What is the wali? The protecting custodian, the protecting friend of the muntaqeen is with them. So whatever difficulties you and I will go through or spiritual challenges, and this really, this section is about our spiritual challenges we're going to go through because life ultimately is a series of physical and mo most of the challenges can boil down to spiritual challenges in, the way, in terms of the way we look at it. But Allah will help us and you'll feel that. That's all in the feeling of Ibrahim alayhi salam feeling. Everybody's thinking that he's burning in the fire, but he's not burning in the fire. It's become part of the salam. It's become cool and peaceful for him. So what does that mean? It's happening because he, Allah is with him and Allah is giving him his assistance. Yes. Right. Alhamdulillah, we're gonna, we're gonna. I think he's gonna get to that quote, but the quote that um, Sidi mentioned is mentioning is mentioned in the Quran in Surah Salah that فَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ يَجْعَلَهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُقُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبُ That whoever has taqwa of Allah, Allah gives them a way out of every problem, and He provides for them where from where they never expected. And Allah is sufficient for the one who places their trust in him. And so that's another benefit, and, um, and inshallah we'll kind of expand on that shortly. The fourth is, oh, subhanAllah, that was the fourth. Nice, nice, uh, uh, yes. So um, the fourth is exactly that Allah saves you from hardships and gives you the ability to have um, lawful sustenance and provision. So problems you go through, taqwa is the way out. It is the exit strategy. That's the way. And you will get you will get assistance in a way that you don't know was even possible. And this is again, we have to step out of the material understanding and into the spiritual understanding of different things in our life. Even I think we spoke about this in the context of financial decisions, that sometimes we limit ourselves to the financial structures of the Western world and are like, well, I have to do things this way. Even if they're haram, even if they're laced with riba and with interest, I have to do it this way because there's no other way. Well, who are you talking about? If there's no other way for the creation, yeah, maybe, but for the creator, it's not difficult for him at all. That from whoever has taqwa, Allah will give them a way out of everything. Allah did not say you'll give them a way out of most things except you know health problems and financial problems, or most things except family problems. He says that give them a way out of everything. Every, every, and that's Everything we do, if we have taqwa, if we are in a state of God consciousness and awareness of Allah, we will, be, Allah will find us a way out. It won't be easy always, but the way out will come and it will feel really, really grateful at the end for achieving that way out. And he provides for them from sources he could never imagine. Sources he could never imagine. What does that mean? That you and I cannot limit Allah to operating within the confines of what we think is possible. Okay, so um, an example of this would be if we say, well, um, you know, I have a, a job offer and it's from a company that's based, their income is based on haram, but it's the only job offer I have. And we're like, yeah, well, but I need to earn money. And so there's the only way, I mean, I've applied to all these other jobs and I'm going to take the haram job offer. Maybe the company makes their money by selling weapons that then the United States uses those weapons and uh, to bomb Muslims in other countries. I mean, many of the, there are many companies that do that. But, but now someone's like, well, I'm taking the job offer because really is it that big of a deal? Is this really happening? And so on and so forth. And now what happens is someone might limit Allah. They might limit the state that um, 
that that that, that what Allah could provide them with. But we don't ever limit Allah. Allah can send you from sources you could never imagine. So don't try to imagine them. Let Allah do that for you. Let Allah give you and me whatever He's He's meant to give us, and that has that reality has to settle in. And you know, this is a really, uh, alhamdulillah. But regardless of the specific topic we're on, it's a very good section. If anyone who has the book, highly recommend just kind of going through this every month or every few months because it's very, very powerful. And especially in Ramadan, I mean, this is what Taqwa is going to do for us if we can attain this state. What is that chapter? This is the chapter. We're on it's the specific section on page 83. It's the third hurdle, the third hurdle someone will face. And it's um, on the cures for the nafs at this point. And the, the book, for those who don't know, is Minhaj al Abidin ila Jannat al Rabbil Alameen by Imam Abu Hamid al Ghazali. So, this one is very important. And one of my teachers, uh, we were going through something, and he said, You need to repeat this ayah in the Quran and reflect on it a lot, multiple times in the morning, multiple times in the evening. Because you will have situations in life, hopefully not, but if we do, someone is sick, there's no cure. All the doctors are like, I don't know what's going on. Or financially, things are getting really constrained. Or all sorts of problems start happening from a The one who has to of Allah, Allah will give them a way out. Repeat it, reflect on it, think about it, and inshallah that, that, that it will actually come to fruition. The fifth is about the improvement of work. So Allah, the one who has taqwa, Allah will give them, their, their works will become enhanced. And this is one of the um, quotes that's, that's often mentioned in the, in the khutbah, the Ya'i Valid Amano, Allah wa that, oh, you who believe, have taqwa of Allah. And speak words that get straight to the point with people. Don't over-embellish things in one direction or another, or, another, or another. And Allah will improve your works for you. You and I, yuslih lakum amalakum, like literally rectify our works. Or we have flaws in our works. We do deeds, we're praying, we're thinking about, you know, dinner or something like that. We're, you know, uh, reciting, if we're reciting Quran or we're doing some dhikr or something, we're usually thinking about dunya. We're not always present. We're on our phones while also doing things. We're just not present sometimes, right? And yuslih lakum a'malakum. Allah improves those works for that person. Allah gives them an improvement in their ibadah. Um, and that's important because the tricks of the nafs, this is actually really critical, the tricks of the nafs uh, is specifically to get you to be impressed with your deen or impressed with your religious practice, we would cover called the Riyadh or Ujjab, that, oh, look at me, I do this, I look like this, I talk like that. So all the tricks that the nafs has, those tricks are preventable or they will be, the, the damage that those the nafs does, because it can harm your deeds if you do a deed for the sake of someone else, the deed can be completely worth nothing at the end of the day because Allah wants you and I to do it for him. But if we try to do it for him, and the nafs gets in the way, but we're trying to have taqwa, inshallah, Allah will improve those works such that, okay, now we get more credit than we, when we actually deserve. We get some extra credit. Allah gives us a spiritual boost. So again, another benefit of taqwa. The um, sixth benefit of taqwa is uh, that it results in the forgiveness of sins. So there's many ways to attain forgiveness for our sins. One of them, and we should do this often, is to ask Allah to forgive our sins. And that's a very important aspect of it. Another one is when you are doing good deeds and you have taqwa, and you are trying to be careful about this, this, or that, and then there might be some sins you and I accumulated, many of them that we don't even really know, we don't remember, we don't even know if it was a sin. The good deeds that we do, it cleans those sins away, and Allah forgives those sins because we had a state of taqwa, because we had a state of uh, God consciousness and God awareness. And Allah is a shakur. He's the most appreciative. He likes that we do those things. Yes? That's why they say follow up a bad deed with a good deed and it will help it. Exactly. Follow up a bad deed with a good deed and it will literally erase the good deed. And it comes to a point where the one who sincerely eventually makes toba, when you actually ask Allah for forgiveness for your sins, let's say someone lived a life of sin and they were Muslim. So they didn't, it's not like you convert later in life and your sins are clean. Or Muslim and that they lived a life of sin. Um, if they repent and turn to Allah sincerely and they get on the right path, Allah actually converts their evil deeds into good deeds. And this is from the Quran. There's no weakness in this. Like this is this is as sound as it gets. It's from the Quran. That he converts, imagine Allah could convert a sin that somebody did, like adultery or 
um, but constantly talking bad about people or all the other sins that someone might do, and he can convert them into good deeds. That's an amazing thing. It's an amazing aspect of this religion that sincere repentance can literally clean everything up that we've done. And um, that's an important kind of aspect to, to consider. The seventh is that Allah, in Allah, you hit al Allah loves the people of taqwa. Now, attaining Allah's love is a very, very high station. And when Allah begins to truly love you, your love for Allah will grow very strong in your heart. And now worship and doing ibadah and doing goodness, it's not something you have to do like, oh man, like I gotta do it. Like, you know, like when, you know, you're, you're some, when we're young and our parents are telling us, did you pray, did you do this? It's like, yeah, yeah, I did it. It's not coming deep from sincerity. Now it's like, I love my Lord. I'm gonna do this from the depths of my heart. In Allah, you hit that Allah loves the people of Taqwa. And, um, there are seven categories of people Allah mentions that he loves in the Quran. And this is, again, one of those categories. And if you attain to say the taqwa, you essentially open up the door to all of those categories. The people of patience, the people who place their trust in him, the people of taqwa, the people of ihsan, the people of justice, the people of purity, and the people of uh, who seek forgiveness a lot, who, who make a lot of toba. Those are the, the, um, some of the ways in which we attain the love of our Lord. The eighth is about acceptance from Allah. So again, this is where the nafs, the nafs is going to come in and try to mess up our deeds such that they might not be accepted. Not every deed is accepted. We have to, we have to think about that. We might do a deed and we don't know if it's accepted. That's why you should never be arrogant. Like, oh, if I do this, this, and this, and this person doesn't do anything, how do you know if that person's five deeds that they did, if you've done a million, if those five were accepted and only two of, of ours were accepted? We have no idea because the arrogant people or the people who think they're better than other people, their deeds are not accepted. They they have Allah does not Allah hates that. And so again, taqwa includes humility because when you're aware always that Allah is watching you, when we're aware that Allah is watching us and Allah is present, we'll feel shy. How can I be arrogant in front of Allah? Allah knows all my faults. He knows everything wrong I've done. He knows all the uh, the bad thoughts that come to me and so on. And so it won't it won't it won't. Um, We'll, feel, we'll have some adab in front of Allah. We'll have some manners in front of Allah. And so acceptance that in Allah accepts only from those min al muttaqin This is a little bit of a weighty ayah that you think only if you attain the state of taqwa that Allah accepts. Uh, but we hope that attempting to do so and that Allah will inshallah accept it as well. The next one, the ninth, is about the bestowal of nobility and honor. So this is status now. It says, surely the most noble amongst you in Allah's sight is the one who has the most taqwa. So now this is about status in society as well. Allah didn't say the one who has the most money. He didn't say the one who has the biggest house. He didn't say the one who drives the bands or the Tesla. He didn't say the one who has the most amount of followers or fame. He didn't say the one who has uh, the most outward uh, adornment of uh, they look the most religious. He didn't say any of that. He said, Allah, nobility comes from, and Allah's weight of nobility comes from whether or not someone has a state of taqwa. And taqwa is in the heart. We know from the Prophet, he said, taqwa ha huna, taqwa ha huna. You won't know someone's level of taqwa. You will see it outwardly. If someone is outwardly following the commands of Allah, that you will see some level of taqwa, obviously, alhamdulillah, someone is on the sunnah, if someone is dressed according to the sunnah, if someone is trying to observe the limits of haya and so on, that's a very good sign of taqwa. But a lot of it is inward, like how humble we are before Allah, or are we arrogant before Allah, or are we, that do we have a state of, of, of uh, a good opinion of others in front of Allah? All of these things are something that's in the heart, and it's covered, you can't see that. Um, only Allah really knows that. And so that is nobility. Now. That means when you meet, when you and I meet people, especially when we like give people status, we should not care who's on the billionaire's list of Forbes. We shouldn't care who has the coolest inventions that this billionaire wants to go to Mars and then this one wants to do this and this one. That, that stuff shouldn't matter. Who doesn't matter who the, the politician is with the most amount of followers or with the most um, rapport amongst people. That's, it, that's not nobility in Allah's eyes. The minute we start or the moment we start to measure Nobility, the way Allah measures nobility, that's when we start to succeed as an Umar. The Sahaba, when Sayyidina Umar, when he walked into the Jerusalem, 
to, to, to uh, essentially the keys were being handed to him of, of the city of Jerusalem. We pray that Allah gives that, that entire land back to the Muslims as it rightfully belongs and that he rectifies the situation, that he removes these evil Zionists from that land. Um, but when he walked in, he was literally walking and the one who was with him, who was like his assistant, was on the camel. And he was in like humble clothing. He was just like, yeah, this is who I am. I don't need to be like a king goes into a city, conquering a city. And a king is like, you know, uh, I mean, again, we don't really have kings these days, but um, that they're really rolling with the whole entourage. They have, um, but that's not the case. That's not the case when it comes to, um, uh, when it comes to the sight of Allah and, and, and being honored in Allah's sight. The tenth is that the one who has taqwa, they will have good news at the time of death. For Allah has said, those who truly believe and have taqwa, for them there are glad tidings in the life of this world and in the hereafter. Lahum al-bushra fil hayat dunya wa fil akhirah. They will have glad tidings of goodness in this world and in the next. So this is now for the one who is uh, hoping for a good ending. Everybody, we, we should all pray regularly for a husn al khatima for a good seal, a good ending. We don't know what our end will be. We don't want to try to live a life of good, but then we slip up towards the end. We regularly pray to Allah, Ya Allah, I don't know what my end state is going to be. Give me a husn al And he says, the one who has taqwa, you try to do the thing because the ways you live. And you and I don't know if our death, when it's coming, God forbid, if there's a car accident or an earthquake which has killed our brothers and sisters, may Allah have mercy on all of their souls. They did not expect, I bet the majority of them, that that was going to happen that day at 4 or 20 or for whatever time in a.m. it was. No one, you don't expect death. But if you live a life of taqwa, most people don't expect death. But if you live a life of taqwa, you will learn that, okay, I could die, so I better not slip up today. I better try not to slip up. If I wake up thinking something could happen, I better hold my tongue when I might, you know, say something rude to somebody or so on and so forth. And so that, again, is another um, uh, another another thing to keep in mind. And the eleventh is the freedom or deliverance or safety from the hellfire. That Allah says, we shall rescue those who practice taqwa. We shall rescue them from the fire and we shall leave those who are evildoers crouching there. We'll leave them there. But those who have taqwa will save them. And far removed from the hellfire will be the righteous. That they won't be, they won't even be close. They won't even have to get near it, inshallah. Again, amazing, right? Taqwa is at the opposite end of the spectrum of evil, of haram. There's a lot of haram that we could do in our life, and we hopefully choose not to do it. The person who's living a life of taqwa, they're on the opposite end of that spectrum. And if we do that, Allah gives us safety from the fire. And the real, there's, there's the outward aspect of the fire of Jahannam, and then there's the reality of the fire of being far from Allah eternally. That if you and I ever feel like the angst of feeling far from Allah in this life, imagine eternally never being able to get close to Allah. Just it's completely impossible. It's just not not happening. That's 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 one of the there's the outward fire is real. That's also the fire that someone goes through the death. At that point, they're begging and they're repenting and they're saying and Allah is just like not listening. Not, you you had your chance. And we don't want to be from that. Because we pray regularly, Allahumma a jinnah min al nar, that oh, Allah save us from the fire and the acts of taqwa that ideally we have in this life, they will save us. And this is the cure for the problems in the modern world. All sorts of crazy ideas are coming into the minds of people in terms of um, how how they view the, how they view things. And, and the one who is seriously concerned about the akhira, they will guard themselves against this. They will guard themselves against this. And then Allah, of course, gives Jannah to the Muttaqeen. Or Iddat lil Muttaqeen. The, the garden has been prepared. It's been prepared for the Muttaqeen. Allah puts that extra, it's not extra effort for Allah, but from our perspective, this special effort in to prepare the, the, jan, the garden for someone. And that's everlasting. Anytime you're going through a problem in this world, remember that it's not going to be here for much longer. You and I won't be here for much longer. And this is not everlasting. This place is supposed to be hard. As we know from the Prophet, the, the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, that this is a prison for the believer. And it's a garden for the disbeliever. The disbeliever will have their garden in this life. This is their jannah. The cars and the homes and the fancy jets and the luxury, this and all that. That's all the garden. That's 
for them. But the real garden is reserved for the people of Taqwa in the next life. That's what a believer in their life may look outwardly like, oh my God, even God, and they're praying. I remember sometime, one time someone asked me, um, or I had mentioned a question, like, I know somebody, they pray, the they do all these things, and everything's going right. How do you How do you explain that? How does that work? How come they're trying so hard and everything's going wrong? That's the sign that they're trying so hard and things are not going well, quote unquote. That means Allah is drawing them near. Because Allah is putting them through it in this life, so he puts them through nothing in this in the next life. Pure gold, in order to purify it, it's put through a fire. It's put through purification. Gold, a diamond, in order to make it make it actually come out, a rock is put under immense pressure, and then the diamond emerges. Nothing is possible without difficulty and hard work. That's that's the case in dunya. Nobody makes it, no one's successful without working long hours and working hard and so on. Religiously, Sometimes we're not doing all that and Allah puts us through something and he wants immense good for us. And that's the, the thing to keep in mind. That there are there are people in this life, maybe someone is struggling to get married. They don't know if I'm gonna ever, they ever get married or struggling to have children or struggling to find a home to live in or struggling to, to eat what they want to eat. All the different things that someone would want to do to remember that that's 50, 60, 70 years in this life of some struggle. But a million to tens of millions, hundreds of millions of years in the next life, inshallah, there's no number because it's infinity, it's eternal of goodness. It's everybody in the next life who makes it to Jannah is married. Everybody in the next life has whatever they want. Everybody, everybody in the next life has no sickness or fear or cancer or worry or stress or anxiety or problems or family problems or arguments or all the tension we feel in this life. There's no, there's no natural disasters, there's nothing. All that's gone and that's eternal. And we have to reflect on that sometimes. Why? That's why the people who we think about the akhira, if Allah gives us the ability, we, we think about the akhira, it'll help us deal with, okay, yeah, this has been a tough day. Alhamdulillah. This has been a tough week. Alhamdulillah. And we'll start to feel something. We'll start to feel a sense of um, patience with, with these difficulties. And just like the brother, um, he just prepared all this, 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 this kind of stuff. You know, assortment of snacks, right? And uh, very quickly, alhamdulillah, and, and he did this that out of his kindness. And this is a small example, right? That Allah is going to prepare immense things for you. Immense, immense. We don't even know what those things are going to be. We have no idea. Allah says you can't even imagine. Any thought that comes to your mind is different than that. You have no idea. But it's not easy. Paradise is surrounded by problems and difficulties. Hellfire is surrounded by ease, luxuries, and desires. In this in this world so it's all it all looks easy why is the person who's sinning why do they have this house and this car and this job and they continue to hurt people and they continue to be rude and, they, and why come they're getting all of it meanwhile this person of taqwa who is doing right they don't even have a home to live in their home was destroyed in in, in an earthquake or in a disaster or whatever how does that add up don't limit the view to this dunya the view of the believer must incorporate the akhira otherwise we won't be able to survive it won't make sense it must incorporate reality. There is the reality, the haqiqah incorporates the light. And that's why Allah says, perhaps you love a thing and in it is much bad for you. And perhaps you hate a thing, or rather, perhaps you hate a thing and in it is much good for you. And perhaps you love a thing and in it is much bad for you. And Allah knows and you and I don't, and you don't know. Don't think you are, and I are al alim. We don't have access. Allah is the most knowledgeable. He has all the knowledge. He has all the information. He has all the wisdom. He has all the that that all the decision making ability rests with Allah. So you and I cannot assume then that we are going to be able to operate in the way that we can we know everything. We have to operate in a humble way, say Ya Allah. I have no idea why this is happening. Please help me. You are my refuge. You are the one I seek refuge in. You are the one who is going to help me, inshallah. And we beg Allah for assistance. And, and inshallah, the assistance then will come. And so these, this is the, um, that, and he will give us good, inshallah, in this life through spiritual gifts and through tranquility and sakina, and inshallah, through the, the next life, in, in the next life. And so this then gets into these 12 traits of taqwa. And it's a topic that the scholars have mentioned, you know, written many, many, many books about. This is just a few pages on the topic. But really the goal for the one who attains the state of taqwa, now they'll have the ability to defeat the nafs, to defeat shaitan, and to defeat their enemies that they that they um, have in, in, in this life. And ultimately, he says it boils down to three things. They'll have divine assistance in everything it is that they do, and they'll have an improvement in their work and a correction of the deficiency in their work, 
and they will have acceptance in their ibadah. And remember, this is the book for the people who are traveling the path of ibadah, right, of worship, meaning it's not now the path of the five pillars only. You're now trying to do more. You're trying to pray extra. You're trying to, to learn more. You're trying to be sincerely devoted to Allah in every moment of your life. And what's the point of all that if it's not even accepted? And then thus taqwa is the means of, um, of acceptance, inshallah. So um, uh, we'll, we'll pause there. And um, if there's any questions, then maybe we'll do one or two other pages. Um, we want to make sure there's enough time for questions and it doesn't get um, too late either. Questions? Yes. So we talk about the bad thing that we talked about the like, thoughts being the company or the uh, Yeah. So is there anything I guess like is there anything good that's coming from internally from trusting when you call that like that? Good question, very good question. So the question is it's referring to a topic we discussed a, a, a little bit ago, which is about how you have bad thoughts, whether there's four categories of thoughts. You have thoughts that are from uh, shaitan, which khatir shaitani. You have thoughts from the nafs, khatir nafsani. You have thoughts from angels. The angels suggest something to you, khatir malikani. And you have thoughts directly from Allah, inspired directly from Allah, khatir rabbani. And so the question is, is that are all the good thoughts basically never really coming from us? Are they always coming from some from, from an angel or directly from our Lord? So in the early stages of the spiritual path, yes, they're, they're not coming us because the nafs is in the state of what's called amara bisu, the evil commanding soul, as mentioned in Surah Yusuf, that the nafs is amara bisu, commands to evil. As the nafs has more taqwa and does more work, it graduates to the next level known as the nafs al lawama. At this point, you will start having thoughts of questioning yourself and questioning whether or not you're doing the right thing. And so this will be now the self-blaming nafs, which is, ah oh, man, I didn't pray, I should have prayed. Ah oh, man, I told myself I was going to read extra Quran and I didn't do it. I was supposed to give charity and you're having that level. And it, it goes on for a long period of time until Allah blesses someone with the station of the nafs al-mutma'inna, which is the tranquil and serene soul. And at this point, um, essentially, while the nafs could fall into times of the evil thoughts coming in, now you may get assistance. You actually will get assistance from this tranquil, the tranquility of the soul because it will no longer be... Um, calling you towards evil, now it's kind of like assisting you towards taqwa and towards good. And the nafs will almost feel like, for example, if you do a good deed every day, and then you don't do that good deed one day. Let's say that you read the sunnah du'as of the Prophet every morning. And then one morning, you just don't do it. Your nafs will feel off. Your you will feel off. Because you are, right, your nafs is part of you, will feel off until you do that. It's like for the person who has to drink coffee every day and you don't drink the coffee, something's off. If you work out every day or like, you know, a healthy number of times a week and you don't work out for a whole week, something's off. The body doesn't, so the nafs won't accept it. It actually is like, come on, I need that. I need that, right? And that's when it's a good sign. It starts to be now, okay, progress, inshallah, is being made. But the careful aspect of it is that in its nature, the nafs is still commanding to evil. It's always still going to try and find a way to trick you at some point. And so until Allah allows us to kind of fully overcome it, so you should assume for the most part that the nafs is trying to play tricks on you and me, but that there are times where inshallah there will be some level of assistance and that has to be governed by the sharia. Meaning you, have, you get a thought and the first thing you do is you weigh that against the law of Islam. And that's why knowledge is so important. And when you weigh it against the law of Islam, now it's like, okay, is this allowed or not allowed? What it, and if it's allowed, and then you go to the nafs, does my nafs incline towards it or not? Could it be for the sake of Allah? Or is it for the sake of other people? Is it for the sake of tension and so on? And then finally, if it all checks out, now you go forward with that deep. So the sign is that someone starts to get more present in their evaluation of thoughts. Like, mashallah, the question of itself is a good question that you even evaluate it. And now that's a sign that you are progressing in that state versus listening um, to the, the, the desire and the thought when it comes in, you just act upon it impulsively. And that's like a very dis a desire um, kind of focused response. Does that make sense? Um, are there questions? questions? Any questions online? Um, 
Okay, I think so. We'll we'll continue for another another page or two, and then um, we'll end in shadow. So he basically summarizes then taqwa right into these into these three areas. And now, if somebody gets to this stage, inshallah, where they really are focusing their life on trying to attain this big, big, big spiritual gift of taqwa. Now it becomes a lot easier to defeat the nafs because you need some defense against the offense that the nafs is playing. The nafs plays a lot of offense. It's always trying to mess us up. Always it's like plotting, plotting, plotting. I'm gonna do this, do that. This desire, this desire. Get him to get him or her to look at this thing, listen to this thing, and just boom, boom, mess, mess, mess with us, mess with us. But taqwa is a shield. You'll see many of the scholars they'll translate this as like a protective spiritual shield. It gives you a spiritual shield. And once someone has this spiritual shield, now it becomes possible to guard against the different enemies that you and I have. Now it becomes possible um, uh, to guard against the different enemies that, 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 that come because it will, be, it will come from within. So you will no longer have to weigh everything like, should I do this? Should I not? Is this a good idea? Would Allah be pleased with this? For the most part, when taqwa is firmly grounded in somebody, it's very clear because you'll just know it'll naturally come in. Okay, no, this is wrong. This is completely wrong. And there'll be gray areas where you consult you 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 consult you know the, the people of dhikr, the people of knowledge, and scholars, and so on. But many other things will just be super clear. Like, no, of course that's wrong. Of course that's something that's wrong. And this is where taqwa is so important to go into the depths of taqwa. What do I mean by that? Don't don't let our knowledge be superficial facts and figures that we just memorize and we just do a few things and then we spend the rest of our life addicted to the same things that the Western society calls us to, to be addicted to. It's, 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 and because what that does is that now messes up your ability to get taqwa right in every situation. Taqwa is not only in a masjid. Taqwa is not only in relation to prayer or to fasting or to knowledge or so on. No, 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 no. Taqwa applies in every aspect of life. Even, for example, in raising children. There is very strange theories out there that have been come that, that that you know usually secular people, atheists, and so on have come up with. They completely contradict the principles of Islam completely. And yet, Muslims, maybe people who practice Islam a lot, but they don't. We we, we don't always have the understanding of what Allah would prefer because our grounding of taqwa is not firm. So the nafs will play tricks on us, and that nafs might get us to slip up in a thing. We thought we thought that our religion has nothing to do with it. Your religion has something to do with everything in life. It is a way of life. It is impossible for the believer to not weigh something spiritually. Almost everything. I mean down to the video game that somebody plays, you weigh that spiritually. Video games in general for the one traveling the path, waste of time, not recommended. But, but if someone is playing it, playing Call of Duty in one of these shooting games where you're shooting up a bunch of Muslims, haram by the fatawa of the Muslims, by the fatawa of the scholars. For somebody to be doing that and to just let their heart Get, get dirtier and dirtier and filthier and filthier from, from literally virtually that doing something that has, a, has an impact on them, not permissible. Just like it's not permissible to play a game in which somebody is having inappropriate relationships with, uh, with all sorts of other people or to watch shows like that. All of that impacts the soul. But this is where Islam is not just something someone learns to memorize a certain number of facts and figures of, uh, uh, and that will it, uh, affect only certain parts of their life. No, no, no. It's comprehensive. It's supposed to be comprehensive. And there is a, an adab of having taqwa with every single part of the day that we go through. Okay, what would be, how would, if Allah was watching me in this moment, how would I want to behave? If Allah was watching me in this moment, how would I want to behave? And so on. And, and that applies to the way we treat our parents, that we struggle, many of us, to have you know, taqwa with our parents. Just like, we, in, at least in Western society, talking back is normal. It's completely normal. Not having respect is normal. Kind of talking bad about your parents to other people is kind of normal. They joke about their parents. It's very, very odd. Versus Muslim society, they have this huge level of adab. You might have somebody who's immersed in many sins, but when it comes to their parents in a Muslim society, in a Muslim country, they're like, nobody talks about them. And no one will, they, they will never mess up their adab with their parents because they still have that. It's grounded deep down inside. So same thing, a relationship with their spouse. That offering... Um, uh, to, to help out around the house. If let's say someone is a man, sometimes people think that only women are, are responsible for doing things around the house. It's not the way of the Prophet ﷺ. He would 
mend his own clothes. He would assist around this house. He would be seen sweeping with a broom. He was assist. He was in the service of his family. That's the way of taqwa. It's the way of taqwa. So all of these things, down to the um, to the friends that we talked about last time, or we talked about this earlier, to the friends that somebody makes, to the online, um, the the platforms that they engage with online, to the different communities that someone joins on that joins online. All of these things require having spiritual grounding. Now, it's difficult to learn the knowledge that, and the associated rulings and the Sunni principles with every single aspect of the religion. But the one who has taqwa and who learns the fundamental principles, Allah will make the situations clear to them. It will become clear. And when the situation is murky, go to the people of knowledge. Ask the people of dhikr and the people of realized internal realities if you and I don't know. And so we ask them. But this is where you and I have to get to a point where we start to govern the different decisions in our life that we make with with, with some level of taqwa, friends that we have, ways that we re, where we interact with our family, the way that we interact with our parents, the way that we interact around the household, the way that we interact our, with our children, the way that we raise our children, the philosophies that we listen to, the ideologies that we follow, who we place on a pedestal and who we don't. A lot of Muslims place Western billionaires on pedestals, not from the way of taqwa, nothing. No, they have nothing to do with our path. And if, if you don't think that there's something wrong with the way that they're living their life, that's, that's a problem, right? Because there's a lot of problems that they're bringing out into the world, right? But, but these are ways that as somebody becomes more grounded. So that's really the core um, component of this is once it becomes firmly grounded, it starts to influence your worldview in every way. And you will now spiritually always be weighing how does this situation work? How would this work? How would Allah want me to behave in this situation? And, and it gets subtle sometimes, and Allah will send a test your way to see, okay, are you really going to be a person of taqwa? And the nafs is constantly resisting it, always. I think we gave this example last time. Someone cuts you off on the road. The natural inclination is to curse at them, to just completely lose our cool. That's from the nafs. We know that. We've all probably done it. But the person of taqwa, okay, okay, perhaps they were having a bad day, try to make some excuses. Try to try to let it go, not 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 make it into this huge story versus becoming humanly angry about it and completely losing it. Because ultimately, it's a test from Allah. Allah is the one who enables everything to happen, good and bad. Because Allah operates outside of the confines of good and evil. Outside, He created both good and evil. They are both creations of of our Lord. Um, so that is the the state ultimately that we want to get to. Now, once this happens, He's going to now get into the next. The way in which someone starts to attain to the state. And it comes from ultimately keeping your heart pure from all sorts of haram. The ultimate goal to attain. Because the Prophet ﷺ, he said, a taqwa ha huna. Taqwa is here. If here the heart is dirty and filthy and filled with dunya and desires and distractions and so on, the, the purity won't be there. But if this is purified, now taqwa can enter. When taqwa enters, now every aspect of your life begins to be governed by this pure state. So the whole goal is going to get into after this, and really probably you could say the, uh, the rest of the book is going to be about purification of the heart. That's the goal. Ultimately, Islam. That, إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهِ قَلْبِ السَّلِيمِ Only one who is successful on the Day of Judgment is the one who, and who goes to Allah with a qalb salim, a sound heart, a pure heart, a heart that is in this, in this state of purity. That is the goal. And the limbs that access most of the heart, he's going to talk about, and we'll cover this next time, the eyes, the ears, the tongue, the, the stomach, and then the heart with, the, with regards to the thoughts and so on that the, that the heart has. Obviously, it has an effect um, on, on, on someone's um, spiritual state. And now this is where we'll start to get the understanding of why we have to be careful of what we watch, what we say, who we hang out with, who gossips around us or doesn't, if we gossip around other people or don't, what we listen to. There's a, always discussion about music and is music allowed or is it haram and so on and so forth. At the end of the day, if it is going to hurt your spiritual state, which probably in 99% of chances it will, it's going to impact your, your taqwa. So avoid it. But that, but still someone knows that. If someone just knows a black and white ruling, this is haram and this is halal, they might not go be able to understand, well, how does this impact me? Because the, the effect of something, right, if it affects you positively will be positive. And there's many, many, many nasheeds and or even lyrics that might do so. But if it's about misogynistic lyrics and killing people and murder and 
um, all sorts of you know sexual promiscuity and so on, which much of what the music out there right now is, of course that's going to affect someone negatively, right? And, and and the people who are leading the way and singing those songs and so on, it's going to hurt someone. If we're watching sports teams all the time, whose primary um, uh, objective is to try and get someone to be so distracted by the world of sports, right? What did the Romans say? Give them circus and give them give them, give them, them food and give them circus and they'll be completely distracted, right? It's just give them sports, give them entertainment, give them food and they'll be completely distracted. This, the person I'm talking about, this lens, they'll start to be like, no, that's probably a waste of time for me to do this. Probably a waste of time for my heart to be too inclined to this because the goal is for your heart to be directed towards Allah always, every single day. And the, the, the approach to doing that is to adorn it with the sunnah of the Prophet and to weigh ourselves ultimately and would the Messenger وسلم, be pleased with seeing me do this? Would he do this himself? And if no, we stay away from it. And if yes, we move towards it, inshallah, that will allow us to attain this comprehensive state of taqwa. And we ask that Allah give this to us and give us the realities of taqwa and that make us the people who are firmly established in taqwa and people who died to taqwa and people who are that, that uh, ways of, of, of establishing knowledge deep inside our own hearts, inside our own uh, communities. So now if there's any final questions and then we'll okay. Yes, sir. Uh, can you talk about the Quran and the Sunnah and how they relate to the Quran and the To, to complain to process thoughts yeah. yeah it's a good question so the question is about complaining and something we mentioned before around um how spiritually usually complaining is very very bad adab Allah, but when would it be okay and is it okay to help process information so this is where the um intention and the manner in which you go about it comes in so if someone is complaining in a way that's like very clearly like oh my god this is this is the worst situation ever i hate this this sucks like it's very very just obvious complaints no that it's not haram but for the one traveling the path spiritually it would not be it would not be virtuous you will be decreased because allah says it's a metaphysical law that if you are grateful i will increase you and if you are ingrateful allah gives you more to complain about and so complaining from that perspective would not be a wise thing and it will bring about more problems in someone's life Complaining from a from a perspective of processing information. So let's say you're going through a um, difficult health situation or um, a difficult family situation, and you are now sharing that with someone to process. Like I went through this, I've, I've been struggling, but I'm trying this out and this. And now you're you're doing it from the form of getting advice. That would be totally fine for someone to do, and it might even fall under this idea of adin and nasiha that the deen is um, sincere concern and, and sincere advice. But where it gets tricky is if two people are just both focusing on the negative aspects of their life and the whole time that they're together, it's all about all the problems I have and all the problems you have, and they can't look at the glass half, and half full, and they're struggling to do that. But that is, is, is where someone now starts to fall into the people of ingratitude. And ultimately, one of the ways of um, the path of ingratitude will lead someone to a form of kufr, not known as kufr of, of committing shirk, but kufr, because kufr means covering up and it means the one who is ungrateful. And so it could lead somebody to becoming ungrateful because Allah, Allah says in the Quran, even to the people of um, the Bani Israel, when Pharaoh did a lot of wrong things to them, he says, remember, remember the ni'mah of Allah when he saved you from the, from the evil of Pharaoh. And then when he bestowed upon you all of these blessings and he lists the blessings, it's interesting. He doesn't say, remember all the hardship that you went through, but rather remember the fact that Allah saved you from that. So he himself is very much focused on look at all the good things that went on. Um, so it's about what level someone is at ultimately, like whatever desire they have to, to and how aware they are that Allah is watching them. If they are feel bad, adab and shy in front of Allah, that oh Allah, I know you're ultimately doing this. And 
if you were, if you are listening to me, and now I feel shy that I'm complaining about this situation in front of you, you should avoid it. But if you're like, I need someone's advice, and Allah has put this person in my life, a sincere friend, a sincere brother, a sister, um, a parent, or so on, to get advice, and you mention negative aspects of life to get advice, that's not only permissible, but many times encouraged. So it kind of toes a balance. Um, and this is ultimately when the heart, as the heart gets purer and purer, it becomes easier to know in which situation, um, kind of how you how you would act, because your your heart is 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 serving as a judge for you. Um, and it's been given what Allah says in the Quran that they will get, the heart will receive a Quran, a criterion by which to judge, and you'll kind of have a sense of what to what to do and how to approach something. Inshallah. Any other questions? Or online? Um, how would one have patience for someone's parents who say hurtful things? How does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want us to react? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so Allah holds you and me to account for what we do and the response we have does matter based on who it is that is saying something to us. So when our when some random person on the street says something, it's very different in the response we have than when our parents say something or when then when our you know elders or someone says something. Ultimately, this, this is a little bit tricky because it you, you're supposed to try to be patient and to pardon and to forgive, but also to protect yourself from that harm. So you're not you and I are not required to just accept like a very toxic relationship and put ourselves in harm's way. If someone is saying really messed up things to us all the time, and if that's our parents, we don't just let ourselves like constantly be in harm's way, but we also, and, and, and now we're talking about from the perspective of our goal, we're not supposed to speak back. We're not supposed to talk back or, or start cursing at them or start seeing, saying hurtful things because the other in that situation is to try to the, 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 um, the, char the character we're supposed to have is to try and say, okay, you know what? I'm going to remove myself. The best thing to do is remove yourself. Remove yourself, or if you feel like your re your relationship is, is strong enough, to eventually approach a conversation where you say, you know what? What you're saying is really hurtful, and it's and it's I, I really don't appreciate it. It really impacts me in this way, that way, and this way. And so I'm going to, um, I'm, I'm you you ask them to try to stop that. And sometimes that needs to be spelled out. But other times, um, someone might say certain things, and Allah says about when someone is attacked. Those who restrain their anger. Those who restrain their anger and they pardon others. And verily, Allah loves the people who are striving to do good. And the people who deserve ihsan the most are our parents. And the mentality you want to try to bring, again, not when it's like super toxic or any form of like abusive. We're talking now about sometimes hurtful things come out of people's mouths, and that's part of the, 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 the test that Allah has. He says we created some of you as a test for others, but you remind yourself of all of the things that your parents did when you were growing up, when you were young, when you were a baby and crying all the time, the, the difficulty that they went through to try to try to take care of you and to try to raise you, the sleepless nights. I mean, there's a lot that goes into it, and to try to really deeply remember that. But at the same time, it doesn't mean what they're doing is right. That they don't have a free pass. They are accountable to Allah for every word that comes out. Just like we're accountable to Allah for every word that comes out. But if the question is, what should our response be? It should ideally be, especially with our parents, one of trying to let it go and pardon and removing ourselves from the situation. Um, and if it's not possible, then you get someone involved, like an elder, an, a, a, a knowledgeable person, a counselor, um, a family therapist to, to intervene and to assist in the um, situation. Yeah. Uh, also, it's good that doesn't only really have forbearance, so that's forbearance. Sometimes you can take a lot of negative talk and just, you know, as long as you know you're good with the most of it. Very good. Very good point. Allah loves it when people have this suburb known as hilm, forbearance, which is a state that the Prophet to Islam exemplified in a lot of ways, where people would come to him, just say the craziest things, just the most absurd things, calling him a magician, calling him like a lunatic, essentially that he's crazy, just all sorts of crazy things. And he just became better and better in his character towards them. These days, somebody, not even our parents, someone says one thing to us, and we just flip completely, completely flip. Like, what do you mean? And this is even in religion. Someone gives us advice religiously, and we're just like, what are you talking about? Don't you know this proof and this? And don't you know? And we just don't want to accept it. But the Prophet 
He allowed for people to sometimes say hurtful things, and he knew that this is a way to increase in character. Um, but there's a balance here in terms of how much someone can handle, and not everybody can handle the same amount of things. And so th this is not like a, giving people a pass to say hurtful things. It's when things are said. Allah says, we pray to some of you as a test, as a fitna for others. Will you not be patient? And so we kind of remember that um, in, in those moments. So I think we have time for one other question. If there's anything online or in person. Sister side, any questions? Okay, online, any questions? Okay, I think there's nothing time for that. So we'll go ahead and end with the du'a. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik wa nashadu wa la ilaha illa sallahu wa barakatuhu wa laikum wa rahman rahim alhamdulillah rabbil alamin Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala sayyidina Muhammadin fil awlin wa salli wa sallim wa barik ala sayyidina Muhammadin fil akhirin wa salli wa sallim wa barik ala sayyidina Muhammadin fil malil ala ila yawmitin ya Allah ya rahman ya rahim la ilaha illa anni subhanak inni kuntu min al-zalimin ya Allah ya rahman ya latif ya latif ya shafi Ya Arham Rahimin, we ask that you pour your mercy down upon us and that you forgive us and that you pardon us, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask that you pour immense, immense barakah into this month of Rajab. Allahumma barakah fi Sha'ban wa balifna Ramadan and allow us to reach this in, in this month of Sha'ban. Pour immense barakah and that allow us to reach the month of Ramadan, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Allow this to be the best Ramadan that we've had in our life today, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Allow us to be in a state of taqwa inwardly and outwardly in every part of our days as we approach Ramadan and allow Ramadan to be a month in which we attain immense nearness to you and that you open the doors of immense spiritual gifts and immense spiritual stations, Ya Rabbil Alameen, direct our heart towards you completely such that we stop wasting our time with the distractions of this dunya and the distractions of the societies that we live in and that we spend our time trying to get closer to you, allow our, our heart to be in a state where we are always present before you, Ya Rabbil Alameen, where we always remember that you are watching us, Ya Allah, and that you are aware of us. Ya Arham Rahimin, Ya Allah, we ask that you have mercy on our souls and mercy on our life, Ya Rabbil Alameen. It is very difficult and many of us, we have difficulties and problems and worries and stress and anxieties and depression and sadness and all sorts of grief that we are going through. Ya Allah, you are a Latif and the most kind and you are the one who is the most generous and you are the one who gives a way out of every difficulty. We ask that you give us and our believers and, and, and the fellow believers in this ummah and our families and our loved ones a way out of every problem and every difficulty it is that we are going through, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask that you make us firm upon the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam and make us firm upon following the Imam Al-Muttaqeen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Allah, we ask that you give immense mercy and forgiveness and lutf and ease to all of our brothers and sisters in Turkey and Syria and all the other places in the Muslim world, Ya Rabbil Alameen, that are struggling and that those who passed away in this earthquake, that you accept them as martyrs, and that you increase their stations, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and that you give them immense stations of nearness and jannah for those with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wa Sallam, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and those who are still here, Ya Allah, but who have no homes and who have no, no place to go to and no place to turn to, Ya Allah, they have you, and we ask that you be present with them and that you give them sakina and that you give them sabr and that you give them hilm and that you give them assistance and that you that you remove any sadness or pessimism or depression that any of them might have and that you give them that optimism, Ya Rabbil Alameen, for the next life, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and that you assist them inwardly and outwardly, and that you give us tawfiq and the ability to assist them, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Allah. We have brothers and sisters all throughout the Muslim world who are getting harmed. We have many of our brothers and sisters in Palestine who were that, that harmed today, Ya Allah, by these oppressors that are over them. We ask, Ya Rabbil Alameen, that you give them complete freedom and that you remove these oppressors from them, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and that you all, those who have been martyred, that you accept them as martyrs, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and that you that you that you that you assist those who have been who are going through this oppression and injustice, Ya Rabbil Alameen, and that you remove those who are unjust and who are tyrants and oppressors over them, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, any of the Muslims that are struggling through any part of the Muslim lands, we ask that you bestow your mercy upon them, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask that you give us the ability that we are in a state, Alhamdulillah, of safety and security, and we have food to eat and we have shelter and we have so many blessings. Please, Ya Allah, while we have these blessings, let us use our time in good because we know that we may not always have this time, Ya Allah. So let us use our time doing good things and trying to get closer to you and let us not be people who waste time, Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Allah. Whatever anxieties and worries and sorrows and sicknesses we have, we ask that you heal them completely and that you assist our parents and our loved ones and our children and our spouses and our family, Ya Rabbil Alameen, in our community with all their problems and that you give us immense love for the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi wa we ask you for everything good that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked for and we ask you for protection for everything evil that he has protection from us sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa barakatuh sayyidina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam alhamdulillah